Welcome back everybody to your daily update on the state of what will soon be the Malazan Empire. <clears throat> and today we're here to start talking about Kelenvet's Reach. I started it today. This is chapters 1 to 5. Well, the prologue and chapters 1 to 5, I think. <laughs> and that's kind of what I read today. And looking at this being the shortest one, I guess we'll be done on Thursday, probably. <laughs> with the entire book, and then we need to figure out whether to go on with, um, what's it called, um, Night of Knives on Monday after, or how we're going to do that. So I'll be, a, I'll, let me know what you think. Do you want to continue with the whole Malazan thing and get right into the novels of the Malazan Empire, or should we do something else in the meantime? I'm up for suggestions, but until then, let's have us a talk about Kellenbit's Reach, shall we? Cheers. Alright, so... Um, Kellenbit's Reach starts out in... A way that I find interesting, in that we have even an even broader panorama, I guess, um, than in the first two books. So from a very tight narrative, just about that one siege in Lehang and those three main, no, well, three main viewpoint characters, we went to um, what's it called, um, Dead House Landing, where we introduce a few more. Um, characters, few more viewpoints, few more places with Cartool and um, well, what happens in Malaz and in Shadow and whatnot. Um, also what kind of happens in Nap. So we have that and now we, even in the first couple of chapters, we jump around quite a bit. I mean, we, we're no longer in Cartool because um, uh, Tay Shren is now in Malaz Island. But we go back to Lehang, we go back to Itkokan, we go to actual Nap, we go to some other places on the Quantali continent and meet a bunch of new characters and viewpoints. So it feels, I guess, more like a typical uh, Malazan novel, like a Malazan Book of the Fallen or Novels of the Malazan Empire book, in that we jump around quite a bit more. Which... I kind of get, because this is sort of leading up to the whole Malazan thing, uh, to the whole Empire thing. But, on the other hand, it's a bit sad, because I really enjoyed the really tight focus of the first novel. And the even still, you know, slightly tighter focus of the second one. But here we are. Um, we need to, you know, broaden up, because this is no longer just about a bunch of, like, crazy young people doing dumb shit in a city. It's way more, it's way bigger and way more complex at this point. And this is certainly reflected in the fact that we have a way larger um, um, panorama of like stuff happening. Now I would say there's um, several important things to look at. One is obviously the way the power dynamic works in the Malazan, with the Malazan crew, with Dancer, Kellenved, Surly, Teshran, and Dasim Ultor, if you can count Dasim in. Um, we have that quite, uh, right at the beginning, we have that whole thing going on with um, Kellenved and Dancer deciding to go off to figure out what's going on with that um, Ima spear thing that they found at the beginning of the first book. And um, we have that conversation with Surly when she asks Dancer what she should do um, if, uh, like, while they are gone. She's like, yeah, do whatever you want with the whole place. And, and we realize that something that, like, Dancer puts it into words, something that we've known all the time, is that, like, neither Dancer nor Kellenvet are actually interested in a worldly empire or worldly power in any way. Dancer is looking for... Um, uh, challenges, things to put himself against, things to overcome, and, well, Kellenved, we don't know, probably power, maybe just finding 
things out. So it's more like magical power and knowledge that he's after. But the Empire is sort of a byproduct, like ruling Mala's Island is sort of a byproduct of all of that. It's not their end goal. Whereas Surly, coming from a aristocratic background in Nap, is very much looking for worldly power to regain her power in Nap, possibly to expand it, and this is the interesting bit there. She, as, a, as an aristocrat, even though aristocrats are oftentimes really bad at ruling and being responsible for their um, subjects, it's at least part of their ethos, right? So Surly is the only one in that regard that actually thinks about the fact that an empire or even just a city, island, state, whatever have you, um, comes with responsibilities. Teishren doesn't care about that. He's just looking for, like, he's the nerd who wants to study stuff. Um, Dasem Ultor doesn't care about it because he's doing Hood's job and that's it. He doesn't care about, like, we, we see that even, like, a, in the conversation that Nadurian has with him when he's like, you, you better start training those soldiers because <laughs> they might need that because they're soldiers. And Dasm's like, well, everyone's going to die anyway. It's like, yeah, but <laughs> you might still help them live a bit longer. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, I'm, I'm a servant of the god of death. I don't care if they live longer. <clears throat> so we have, like, no one really caring for, like, the general, like, the people at this point. Um, except Surly, and Surly doesn't, you know, really, but at least she thinks about the fact that there is, you know, logistics and administration that has to be done. And once again, as an aristocrat, she kind of also feels, I guess, that it's her, I don't want to say divine rabbi, it's her right to rule and do these things. Turns out she's just not really good at it, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> so far, she's doing the best job out of all the people that are available. And this is important because, for what will happen later when we read Night of Knives, for example, um, that here at the beginning of Kelenved Reach, Dancer explicitly says Surly that she can do whatever she wants with the place if they don't come back. Um, he, he basically gives her, like, carte blanche to do with the Empire whatever, or, like, do with Malaz Island whatever, if they don't show up again. And the question is, like, how long do you wait before people come back? So keep that in mind for later on, that this actually has explicitly been said. So Surly has a lot of motivation to um, not usurp power, but um, to um, actually, um, I had to say, make that power that she already has, like, build that into, like, a solid foundation, make these things more than just, like, um, more than just um, happenstance. And this is something that we can see throughout the entirety of those first couple of chapters, is her recruiting more and more people, recruiting people that work directly for her, having bodyguards, having agents, having spies, <clears throat> all of that. She's running the entire, she's basically running the entire, um, like, foreign policy arm of the, <laughs> of that crew at this point because the others don't care at all whereas you know Teishren is running around recruiting mages or trying to recruit mages and um Dasim is apparently at some point starting to train people and well Dancer and Kalinved run around somewhere in Quantali and we're gonna go into that in a minute But overall, I find it a like very interesting aspect to see how um, how the entirety of that organization is built up and um, consists of very very different people with very different aims and capabilities, and how that will then later on form the basis for what becomes the Malazan Empire and explains why things happen in specific ways in the Malazan Empire, I guess. But now let's look at um, the new people, right? The largest thing there is obviously um, the whole, like, feudal warfare on Quantali. Now, this is interesting for a bunch of reasons. First reason there is um, it's a part of, like, uh, of the Malazan world that we haven't seen much of before. I mean, it gets kind of started in Dance's Lament when the Crimson Guard went out with uh, that 
prince, this Grecian prince, uh, who gets himself killed by Rhinanderus. Um and we have that scene when they have like all these like about these jewels in front of the wall of Li Hang with uh, the Chinese people. So we know that this kind of thing exists. But that's about it. <clears throat> now we come to the dark side of that. We have like all these city states. We have Blur. We have um, oh gods. I can't even. Yeah, Gris. We have obviously Tali. Um, we have even more of those. And I, I keep forgetting them. It doesn't really actually matter. The main point is that you have these small. Um, feudal states with nobility that um, behaves like nobility in feudal systems and feudal societies behaves. That means um, exploiting the peasantry as much as possible <coughs> and um, having a very, very different concept of warfare compared to anyone else who actually goes into warfare. That being, you know, the, the whole idea of like honor and glory and ransoming people that get, you know, killed but um, defeated and <laughs> following very specific rules, whereas the common soldiery, which we see a lot of going on here, um, are not like that. They, you know, they try to survive and are basically cannon fodder, well, not cannon fodder, but, you know, spear fodder or whatever you have there. We see that a lot, how they, like, really badly... Um, Equipped badly, uh, trained, and all of that, and their only their only role basically is uh, to either save the nobles or just stand there and be killed slowly. We see two parts of that. On the one hand, we see the Hamlet's whole storyline with the stonemason Gregor. I, I keep forgetting his name. Um, and the the new mage, um, that the other mage that also skinny and slightly mad, which kind of mirrors in a way mirrors the dancer and um, Kellenbet uh, story from earlier on, had them fleeing from Gris and trying to join the Crimson Guard, which doesn't really work. Now they're stuck in the in the army and uh, learning how to fight. Well, they're not learning how to fight, they're just doing the stuff that happens there. And then on the other hand, we obviously have the um, the, the, the group of um, mercenaries under... Oh God, I keep forgetting his names. I, I promise I'll know names tomorrow, I hope. <laughs> but someone I suspect to become Grey Mane because he already has grey hair. And... Um, as I said, they, this will be interesting to see. Um, but we have the professional soldiers who um, have way more quality, like the, the, the mercenaries who see what the nobility does wrong when they lose, and uh, like through incompetence and so forth, um, and are able to judge that and maybe make a difference. We have that part of it. And on the other hand, we see obviously those poor um, regular soldiers who are basically just pressed into service as, you know, a form of taxation. And I find it very, like, not very fascinating, but what I appreciated about that part is that um, in Esselmant is not, is not holding back there. He's very explicit in stating on how, the, how that feudal system works. He's very explicit in stating that it's basically um, like using those people as soldiers, as pike wielders mostly, which is obviously the worst part of like being a soldier ever, um, or spear carriers, not even pike wielders, you know. But you know, uh, that being a form of taxation and um, exploitation, he's very explicit about that, and I think it's important to keep that in mind because it's something that we certainly find in medieval. Um, um, or late medieval and early modern warfare in Europe. And this is the other part. This particular stuff with those small kingdoms in Quantali squabbling with each other is as close to medieval, typical medieval fantasy in Europe, your middle, you know, typical European medieval fantasy that we see so much of or have seen so much of over the years. Um, is as close as we get to that in the Malazan world. So it's just fun to see that it is there and see also all the disadvantages of it and showing the romantic romanticization romantic yeah romanticization of it um um because the other bit there that we learn with the ransoming and so forth is that because you have that higher like nobility or aristocracy 
aristocracy, we have that point, right? They, there is very few consequences for them to engage in that continuous warfare. They gain honor and glory, and maybe they lose, so they get, you know, disgraced for a while, or just ransomed, and then they just go and play again. The, the, the consequences for the nobility are far more, like, far less tangible than those for the common soldiery, which obviously explains why in such a system you kind of have continuous warfare, because there's a lot to gain in the system that makes the nobility, that being honor, glory, and reputation, and there's very little to lose in the way of, you know, life and stuff like that. So, of course, that that whole conflict will continue until someone comes and changes that entire system which is what we will see with the Malazan what we see with the Malazan empire later because the Malazan troops are actually well equipped and well trained um and the common soldier is appreciated in a way that the common soldier they are not appreciated under the um feudal systems of Quantali so it's something that we spoke about before the idea of that being something of disruptive agent the the Malazan empire and we'll see where that will be going in the future, I guess. So this is something that I found nice and interesting in a way when you look at the Malazan Book of the Fallen and also part of the novel of the Malazan Empire being classed as classified as military fantasy because they depict a lot of like military life and all of that. They do that and in the Malazan Book of the Fallen at least we see the soldiers and the soldiers life while being depicted in a realistic way or a semi-realistic or yeah it feels real there's some there's a certain level of verisimilitude there um, it's also rather positive because it's a well-working army. The Malazan soldiers might bitch and have problems with like individual commanders and shit like that. But the overall situation of the Malazan marine or the Malazan soldier in general is a good one. Which is something that you see a lot of in military fantasy because your characters, your, your soldiers are the heroes. Being in the military is seen as inherently positive in a way. <laughs> At least in a lot of it, you know, if you go to your Glenn Cook's um, um, Black Company, that certainly has parts of that as well. It's like, while they are not always good guys in the military there, in the Black Company, they're certainly, um, the, you know, while there are scenes where, like, being part of the Black Company is not fun and they're disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged and everything, they're still sort of, you know, badass and everything. But there's another aspect to being in the military, and that's the one that we get that Esselmont explores here with um, uh, the recruits. There is like, no, for a lot of people, especially in your medieval fantasy world, your pseudo medieval world, being a soldier sucks a lot, is really terrible. You have a life expectancy of a couple of weeks if you're lucky, and stuff like that. Which is still military fantasy, because you still have all those things. You have the training montage, you have the all the tropes. You have the angry sergeant who isn't really a bad person, but just, you know, your cliché sergeant and everything. You have the camaraderie with uh, Leah and Gerard, Gregor. I, I'll, I'll find out his name anyway. Um, we, you have all of those things that you have in military fantasy, but this time around, those soldiers are the absolute losers of the entire thing. They, they're they basically expendable and um, their life sucks. So I, I, I appreciate the fact that we see that part of military fantasy here as well, where the military or the people that we know in the military are actually really bad <laughs> at their job. And the military, the, the, the military units are really bad at their job. The individuals may be good fighters, we will see about that once we have like combat going on and we obviously have that other trope of military fantasy that being like the 
commanding officers being terrible at the at their job, the employees being your you know your employers being very bad at a job. We have that when it comes to the that fort they need to defend that. Um, Someone I suspect will be Grey Mane, um, uh, and the other group are supposed to um, abandon and go ha home to the to the to the capital to defend it against Gris, not Gris, or or maybe Gris. I, I, as I said, I'm confused with all of those places right now. Um, but the point is that we see that that's tactically a really dumb decision, but it's the nobility who doesn't know shit about actually soldiering doesn't get that. But our professional soldiers understand that, so they find a way to uh, ignore orders or countervene orders, uh, countermand orders, and actually get the right thing done. Which, as I said before, is very much another trope of. Um, Military fantasy, no matter which one, um, uh, no matter which one you're looking at. So, um, what else should we talk about about this first book? <clears throat> All right, we meet Heboric. Heboric, um, still with hands, um, doing something of a, um, I don't want to say pilgrimage, but he's certainly wandering around visiting different guards because there is that whole thing that there is that kind of upheaval going on um, in the Warrens and he's trying to find out what is going on, which is smart because, you know, if we have a pantheon with guards that are that have different domains, which, you know, is kind of where it comes from, um, they should maybe sometimes communicate if the overall system is endangered but yeah we'll see where that goes he's on his way to some island uh, which seems like a leper colony we'll see um, when he's uh, addressed by his um, more um, hierarchically minded uh, brethren and sisters sister do you say sister I have no idea brothers and sisters of the cult anyway and they ask him to return to the fold and take on whatever role he could get within the cult of Fenner, and he declines because he is on a mission. Which, you know, is an interesting idea because it kind of sets up that favorite, one of those favorite tropes of having religion in fantasy books. <clears throat> of On the one hand, you have the bureaucracy, you have the hierarchy, where everyone is just struggling for mundane power within a religious system. And then you have the true believers <clears throat> who have some kind of... Um, revelation or whatever connection to the actual deity which in this world is, exists and they are going against the hierarchy and this is something that is very interesting to me that we very rarely have fantasy worlds where a religious hierarchy is ever a good thing and there's like a, ph a philosophical idea behind that that hierarchies are bad um, that hierarchies are especially bad in religion because in religion they kind of um, prevent um, or go against the original doctrine of the religion, which is an interesting idea <laughs> for a lot of reasons. And my suspicion is that it comes from, um, at least in Western society, our general like mistrust for a lot of people of organized religion, especially um, the Catholic Church being the sort of organized religion in our medieval settings that are usually the inspiration for um, fantasy books. And while there is a lot of truth to that, the Inquisition not being, you know, the best thing that ever happened, the Crusades certainly not being a really cool thing, and a lot of other stuff that is, like, interesting in church history and bad in church history, <clears throat> let's just say we have, most of us, even religious people, I guess, a lot of religious people, have a very, very bad image of um, medieval church in our heads. And I feel it kind of expresses itself in um, the way we portray religious orders um, within um, our fantasy worlds. And we see something of that here, at least in the basis. We don't learn that, you know, the Fenner cult is as corrupted as, say, um, the Rex cult with Tallow, that um, Inquisitor, um, and who's already close to chaos and stuff like that. We don't see anything like that here. It's just that... Um, there is already that um, conflict between true belief, on the one hand, and um, following the um, 
structured hierarchy of the cult on the other hand. We'll see where that will be going in the future. All right, what else would be interesting? Um, yeah, quick updates. We finally actually get to see what's going on in, um, in Nap with um, Soli's brother, and we go back to um, it Kokan for a second to meet Iko, who is still doing her thing with um, the new uh, uh, the new king, where she's still like his protectress. And there's a warning by a witch who is scared of what is going on on Mala's island because at some point people realize that Kellen is mucking about with shadow will lead to a lot of consequences. <laughs> and she first warns um, the witch, Jardine. First um, warns, um, or goes to the court in Kokan, and then hires on with um, the king of Nap to maybe do something about Kalanved. We'll see where that is going. <clears throat> At the same time, we have another interesting aspect with the seti, uh, the encounter with the seti in um, and Kellenbed and Dancer about the fact that their um, nomad lifestyle is threatened or about to end and they're aware of it which once again is one of those <laughs> themes that we see a lot in the Malazan world both in um, Stephen Erickson's writings and in uh, Esselmans in Esselmans writing because it's something that I guess comes with um, that anthropological background you see how um, certain like you know, agrarian societies um, take over more and more land, making the hunter-gatherer <laughs> societies, uh, you know, encroaching on them, and you ha and they them having basically no real options to do anything about it. So we we we, we certainly have that um, thing going on there <clears throat> once again, and then we obviously have the scene when they when when. Kellen Bed and Dancer come to the valley and find all these other Talana mass um, relics and don't find whatever it is they're really looking for. And um, that's sort of where we ended, where I ended today, um, with that disappointment and them going back to actually um, deal with um, worldly issues for once. And we'll see how that turns out in the next couple of chapters that I'll be talking about tomorrow. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if so, like, subscribe, share, do the whole thing, um, make comments, yell at me in the comments, and so forth. And um, I'll talk to you tomorrow about way more of it, I guess. Until then, cheers.